Diabetes is a metabolic disorder that results in chronic hyperglycemia, abnormally elevated glucose levels in the bloodstream. It's a major health problem worldwide, affecting over half a billion people, and its incidence and prevalence continue to rise around the world as people increasingly adopt more sedentary Western lifestyles associated with higher rates of obesity, in addition to other trends such as urbanization, aging populations, and diabetics living longer. One of the primary organs involved is the pancreas. While over 95% of the pancreas consists of acinar cells that secrete almost all of the digestive enzymes necessary for digestion within our GI tracts, like amylase, trypsin, and lipase, the remaining 3% of the pancreas are scattered clumps or islets of cells that serve a different, rather important, and endocrine function, secreting two hormones into the bloodstream, insulin and glucagon. Insulin instructs liver, muscle, and fat cells to extract glucose out of the bloodstream, while glucagon instructs liver cells to release glucose into the bloodstream. Diabetes occurs when there's a breakdown in the function of the insulin signaling pathway. In some people, this breakdown happens when an autoimmune process destroys the pancreatic islet cells, eliminating the body's ability to make insulin, a condition we refer to as type 1 diabetes. In the vast majority of people, however, this breakdown occurs when muscle cells and fat cells in the body gradually become less responsive to insulin, a condition we refer to as type 2 diabetes. Unlike type 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes, the more common type by far, tends to be gradual in onset and is often asymptomatic in its early stages, which means that its onset may often precede actual diagnosis by several years in some people. Type 1 diabetes, on the other hand, can sometimes appear rather suddenly, especially in kids, presenting with the classic symptoms of hyperglycemia listed here in white and on occasion, serious cases of ketoacidosis that could even lead to coma or death. Diabetes is also associated with many long-term outcomes that lead to considerable pain, suffering, and death. Long-term diabetic macroangiopathies predispose patients to coronary artery disease, cerebrovascular disease, and peripheral vascular disease, while long-term diabetic microangiopathies, which can act synergistically with smoking and hypertension, predispose patients to diseases that threaten their vision, kidney function, and can cause debilitating limb pain and numbness that predispose patients to serious soft tissue ulcers, infections, bone, and joint damage. Besides angiopathies, diabetics may also be predisposed to other conditions, including cardiomyopathy and increased susceptibility to infections. With diabetes, one of our big goals is to avoid these long-term consequences of diabetes that are responsible for so much pain and suffering through early diagnosis and intervention. While primary care providers screen for and catch many patients with diabetes through a combination of risk factor assessment and blood tests, Many people still slip through the cracks, a lot of times because they just haven't gotten around to seeing a primary care provider in a while. As a radiologist, however, you can help if you're able to flag patients who would benefit from a diagnostic diabetes workup because you're familiar with these incidental imaging signs that your patient might have diabetes. Let's begin with number one body fat redistribution. The correlation between type 2 diabetes and a redistribution of body fat from subcutaneous sites in the body to ectopic sites, specifically around the heart and around solid abdominal organs like the liver, the pancreas, and kidneys, has been widely reported in the medical literature. In addition to an established correlation with diabetes, redistribution of body fat to ectopic sites is also correlated with adverse cardiovascular events such as heart attacks and strokes, 
in addition to all-cause mortality. Number two, fatty infiltration of the liver or hepatic steatosis. While hepatic steatosis is also correlated with things like steroid use, obesity, and alcoholism, hepatic steatosis is present in at least 75% of patients with type 2 diabetes. Typical imaging features of hepatic steatosis on CT are liver parenchymal attenuation, less than 40 Hounsfeld units, or liver parenchymal attenuation that's at least 10 Hounsfeld units lower than the spleen. While on ultrasound, hepatic steatosis results in a hyperechogenic liver, which can be recognized as liver echogenicity that's noticeably higher than that of the adjacent right kidney and decreased conspicuity of the hepatic and portal veins against the surrounding liver parenchyma. The pathophysiology of hepatic steatosis in diabetics is not clearly understood, but some folks believe it's because liver cells resistant to insulin absorb less glucose from the bloodstream, leading to decreased intrahepatic glucose and depleted intrahepatic glycogen stores. The liver compensates by increasing gluconeogenesis, which leads to elevated levels of substrates such as acetyl-CoA that get converted into fatty acids, acids, which can get esterified into triglycerides, leading to fat accumulation within liver cells. Number three, hyperechogenic deltoid muscle on ultrasound imaging. Common indications for shoulder ultrasounds are suspected sprains, strains, or muscle tears. Hyperechogenic deltoid muscle is a powerful predictor for diabetes with a positive predictive value of nearly 90% and over 80% reported specificity. Fat infiltration of the deltoid muscle results in this hyperechogenicity, and it's believed that the pathophysiologic mechanism may be similar to what occurs within the liver in the setting of diabetes. Number four, decreased psoas major and paraspinal muscle mass. While psoas major and paraspinal sarcopenia or muscle wasting is correlated with back pain and predictive of adverse cardiovascular events, falls, and death, it is also correlated with diabetes. Commonly expressed in terms of a muscle mass index calculated as cross-sectional muscle area divided by the patient's height squared, patients with type 2 diabetes are three times more likely to exhibit sarcopenia than non-diabetics. Number five, pancreatic volume loss and fatty replacement. While pancreatic volume loss and fatty replacement may occur in the setting of advanced age and cystic fibrosis, Pancreatic fatty replacement is associated with type 2 diabetes, and pancreatic volume is negatively associated with both type 1 diabetes and type 2 diabetes. Here's a set of CT images of five patients with diabetes highlighting different levels of severity of these sorts of pancreatic changes of volume loss and fatty replacement. Number six, renal atrophy and hyperechogenicity. Renal atrophy or volume loss may occur in the setting of renal artery stenosis, chronic urinary tract obstruction, or chronic kidney infection, but it's also correlated with diabetes. Renal hyperechogenicity on ultrasound is another finding we'll sometimes encounter in patients with diabetes. Though, hyperechogenic renal parenchyma may also occur in the setting of sickle cell disease, hypertension, glomerulonephritis, and HIV nephropathy. Finally, number seven, 
vasodeverins calcification. While bilateral vasodeverins calcification may normally occur in men in their 80s and older, it's rare in younger men, and premature calcification of the vasodeverins is pathognomonic for diabetes. So these are the seven imaging clues that your patient could have diabetes. When I encounter echogenic deltoid muscle, or premature bilateral vasodeferens calcification, I'll usually call out the strong correlation of these findings with diabetes in my report. I'll usually offer a softer statement when I encounter ectopic fat redistribution and hepatic steatosis. As for the remaining three imaging clues of diabetes in the paraspinal muscles, pancreas, and kidney, I might mention a correlation with diabetes in my report if it was apparent that other potential explanations for these particular imaging findings didn't exist.